listening to the October 16, 2015 edition of the Cybercrime and Business Podcast, the weekly podcast that's focused exclusively on how the world of cybercrime is impacting business. On this episode, we have an interview with Thomas Roback. He's an experienced trial and appellate lawyer and a partner at Axon, Veltrop, and Harkrider. And we chat about some of the recent legal developments regarding data breach lawsuits and how the various court rulings are impacting whether those cases have standing. This podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Hello, I am Jeff Peters, Surfwatch Labs editor, and I'm here with Matt Leifus, Surfwatch Labs writer. The interview with Thomas Roback will be coming up a little later. I thought it was really interesting being able to actually speak to a lawyer and get his opinion on a lot of this because, you know, we see all these lawsuits and we talk about them every week. So it's kind of nice to, to get his opinion on, on all the stuff that's going on. And that'll be coming up in a little bit. But first, we'll throw it over to our good buddy Matt, as always, to recap some of the top trending cybercrime events of the past week. Yeah, let's get right into it. This week, Surfwatch Labs collected data on 69 industry targets negatively associated with cybercrime, and another 254 are being discussed on the dark web. From that information, as everyone knows, we get our top trending industry targets for the week. Coming in number three, we have the Pakistan Meteorological Department. The department's website was the target of a web defacement attack last weekend. The attack seems to be politically motivated as the attacker was identified as Mohammed Wasim, a member of the Pakistan cyber attacker team. Wasim displayed the messages Go Nuaz Go and Pakistan Zindabad on the website. I might not have said that right either, Jeff. I'm not sure. Coming in number two, we have America's thrift stores. In an official statement released this week, America's thrift stores provided information about a data breach of their systems. The breach appears to have occurred through software that is used by a third-party service provider, so another third-party service leading to a data breach. Customers who made purchases between September 1st and September 27th of this year potentially could have had their payment card information compromised. Coming in at number one, this one made a lot of news. We have Dow Jones. The company disclosed information pertaining to a data breach of their computer systems. Both payment card and contact information were compromised, putting 3,500 people at risk. The security breach took place over a three-year period, with criminals hacking the system at certain times between August 2012 and July 2015. Those are the top trending industry targets of the week. Now, we're one of the things I talked about, payment cards uh, being compromised. When I tend to think about payment cards being compromised, I tend to think of retail and the consumer goods sector. And it just so happens that we had a very, very productive week in terms of, well, productive might be the wrong word. But um, we had a big week concerning consumer goods and cyber crime. Let's talk about that, Jeff. What we got going on? Yeah, I was reading your weekly risk report. For those who don't know, Matt puts out a weekly risk report. You can see part of that on LinkedIn each week. But what what stood out to me is we got the the risk scores over time, that chart. And for the consumer goods risk score, you know, the little squiggly stock-like chart just seems to be kind of going up and up and up over the past 90 days. And now the consumer goods sector now has the second highest overall cyber risk score behind just the financial sector. And I thought that was interesting because I, you know, if you remember, I'm sure you remember this, Matt, but going back to the beginning of the year and even like through like March and April, it seems like we were talking about how nothing was happening in consumer goods. And now kind of heading into the holiday season, you know, we're seeing all these breaches uh, leading up to that. Yeah, literally nothing. I mean, we we were at, we talked about it quite a few times. There's just nothing was going on, it seemed like. Last week, there was an interview about EMV uh, that Jeff conducted. And uh, Brian Krebs wrote a little something about it last week as well. Um, Brian Krebs wrote, The huge number of card breaches at U.S.-based organizations over the past year represents a response by fraudsters to changes in the United States designed to make credit and debit cards more difficult and expensive to counterfeit. Yeah, and, and a lot of people that we have talked to on the podcast have made that same point, that we might see a rise, trying to sort of get the the last boom before, you know, the market dries up and they have to switch to another type of fraud. You know, everyone's predicting it's going to switch to uh, 
online fraud, the card not present fraud instead, once this EMV kicks in. But, you know, like Monica Eaton Cardone was saying last week in the interview, you know, that's, that's going to take a little bit of time. It's probably going to be a few years before this EMV te- technology becomes widespread. But going back to consumer goods, a- after you, you wrote that risk report, Matt, and I saw that, I, I went into our data just a little bit ago, just wanted to see if if uh, if Surfwatch Labs data backed up what Krebs and other people are saying and, and the risk score. And it was kind of surprising. I mean, it's only October 15th right now as, as we're recording this. There's already been five pretty significant point-of-sale breaches or announcements that have come out this month. Matt talked about America's thrift store. Uh, they announced the point-of-sale breach. There's this company called Glamgo. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, Matt. Are you, in, are you into skincare? <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm all about it. No, I, I've never heard of Glamgo until I, we read about it online. Yeah, I believe they have the mud and stuff you put on your face. They announced a data breach that occurred uh, between September 2014 and May 2015. Then there was, just this morning, we saw the Peppermill Casino. They put out a breach notification saying that payment and debit cards from their front desk were stolen. And then FireEye this week, they said that an unnamed casino had 150,000 credit cards stolen. Bed Bath & Beyond. Just one store in New York, so it wasn't a big breach, but they had a, a point of sale breach as well. Kind of gone from absolutely nothing in consumer goods to, to to quite a bit of activity. On top of all that, there is an interesting article on uh, CSO this week uh, concerning Walmart. The Philadelphia Federal Credit Union issued an alert related to the fraud at Walmart, kind of chronicling some of what's going on. The fraud pattern included charges of $50 and under, which are being processed as pinless debit transactions. Now, with these transactions, you swipe your card, but you're not asked to enter your PIN or sign for the transaction. So, I mean, essentially anyone could, if you had like a fraudulent card or something, you go right up to the line, swipe the card. They require nothing from you to validate like, you know, hey, I'm the actual owner of this card. Now, this one credit union, uh, the Philadelphia Federal Credit Union, they began requiring pins for on all transactions to combat this problem. It's worth pointing out that yeah, this fraud is taking place at uh, Walmart's. I believe it's uh, throughout 16 states that this fraud's turning up in Walmart's, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Walmart was like their systems were compromised. You know, it, it's another scam that's going on with consumer goods, with retailers, and it involves Walmart, which, as everyone knows, is a pretty large company. Yeah, and it's just because they're so large, it's an easy place for people who counterfeit these cards to go and translate that cybercrime into actual, you know, merchandise and cash. And it was interesting reading that article because a lot of these credit unions and banks who are noticing this fraud, you know, it's not just the Philadelphia Federal Credit Union, but a few other ones are implementing rules, you know, requiring pins at Walmarts and Super Walmarts and things like that, which honestly, I don't, I mean, I guess it's just a, a convenience thing, but I mean, how hard is it to sign for your purchase or to enter your pin, really? Um, yeah, it's interesting we bring this up because I'm, I'm actually going to be putting out an article tomorrow. I did a Q&A with uh, Richard Peters. He's the director at the Berkeley Research Group. And we talked at length about EMV and uh, some of the safety measures that are put in place. We didn't talk about this specifically, but we did talk about how, like with debit cards, that a lot of times you can just push credit and swipe your debit card and You know, at times you don't have to sign for anything. There's no pin. And his answer was pretty interesting because he actually attributed it to laziness. I think it was actually a Brian Krebs article. He had an interview with the lady from Visa and uh, and someone from Gartner. And they were talking about, you know, chip and pin versus chip and signature. And a lot of people argue chip and signature is safer. I think that's what the FBI said. You know, the, the pin is the way they want everyone to go. And they were kind of arguing that they didn't want to to train everyone in the U.S. to do two things at once. So maybe they think everyone in the U.S. is ignorant. <laughs> Obviously, the first thing is, uh, and I don't, I'm sure you've seen this, Matt, too. I was, you know, I was just at Walgreens the other day, and there was a, an old lady in front of me, and they're trying to figure out how to use the EMV reader, and the person sure. got to explain sure. to them. So there's, there's that whole transition and learning curve that everyone has to go through is how to use these new readers, which, you know, isn't exactly rocket science, <laughs> but... <laughs> But, you know, they didn't want to have to train on that and then also have to train on on the second thing of everyone now needing a pin. And then you got multiple pins for multiple cards. Uh, so the, the the speculation was kind of we'll start with the signature only. And then if 
at some point in the future, it seems like we need to, the banks need to switch over to chip and pin because it would be prudent for them, then they will. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't see how that's so difficult, but you know, this I, is America. Not, We're not one of these European countries that can handle EMV. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some of the consequences of our laziness then. I was reading an article on Reuters and it was talking about how cyber insurance is rising for companies. And when I say rising, I'm not talking about the amount of coverage they're offering. I'm talking about the premiums they're charging. Premiums are going up, deductibles are rising, and coverage is going down. Now, the two most affected industries in this, we had health insurers, which we've talked at, at length about some of the big breaches this year with that. You know, Anthem comes to mind. And retailers. As a matter of fact, with retailers, their premiums have, have surged 32% in the first half of 2015 after staying flat all through 2014 and 2014 as us in the cybersecurity world like to say was the year of the data breach. So a lot of organizations right now are having a hard time affording the premiums for the coverage that they need for their company. And that's a direct reflection on we have all these data breaches and people don't take things. It, it might, it's, it's easy to say they don't take things seriously because I'm sure they do. No company wants to be breached, but there, there's consequences to this. And it's costing companies a ton of money. In that Reuters article you referenced, they said that a lot of these uh, insurers are, in addition to raising deductibles, they're putting caps on the amount of coverage, um, sometimes like $100 million, which seems like a, a huge amount of money, $100 million. But for these huge companies, you know, they could potentially lose more than that from, from a big data breach. Target said in their filing that it expects insurance to cover just $90 million of the $264 million worth of costs related to its... its uh it's breach in, you know, holiday time of 2013. Yeah, and that's why I've been, you know, talking about the small organizations that are already having troubles coming up with the resources to afford these premiums. We did an interview with a guy who sold cyber insurance out of New York. It was one of, I think, our first episodes in the podcast, so maybe we should bring another guy in to kind of update everyone on the changes. But the, the people that I've interviewed have, have basically talked about how that's going to happen. There's kind of a emerging market, so there's going to be a, a lot of, People don't really know what the cost is, and there's going to be a lot of adjustments um, on that front. And that's, then that's just kind of what we're seeing is kind of trying to find that proper equilibrium for how much these policies should cost and, you know, how that risk is going to be transferred. Yeah, so so we'll move on before we bore you guys too much who are listening out there. Um, with You know, everyone loves talking about insurance, I'm sure. But, you know, we had a, we had quite a few advisories this week as well. Uh, we'll try to get you guys caught up on a couple of them that came out. Now, one of the big ones is there's another Adobe Flash Zero Day. Yeah, I don't know how many there's been this year. I can't even keep count. it got to be at least one a week at this point, it seems like. It's yeah. crazy. Trend Micro discovered this new Adobe Flash Zero Day. It's being used in the Pawn Storm campaign. Adobe released a security advisory about the Zero Day. And this campaign, what it's doing is it's targeting foreign affairs ministries around the world via phishing emails. Uh, that contain a link, which leads to this Adobe Flash Zero Day exploit. And, and this is still on patch, so, you know, pretty much everyone is saying, don't use Flash, disable it in your browser, things like that. So kind of a, a little bit of deja vu with that advisory. Another advisory out there this week had to do with Iranian hackers using LinkedIn to target employees. The Iranian hacking group believed to be behind the cyber espionage campaign dubbed Operation Cleaver has a network of fake LinkedIn profiles used to target employees of corporations in the Middle East, according to researchers from Dell's SecureWorks Counter Threat Unit. The level of detail in the profiles suggests that the threat actors invested substantial time and effort into creating and maintaining these personas. Operation Cleaver always makes me laugh. I don't know if you, did you watch Sopranos when it was out? Yes. <laughs> and Christopher Moltisanti, he makes yeah. the, the, the slasher film called Cleaver. Yep. So every yep. time I hear Operation Cleaver, I think of these Iranian hacks. <laughs> it's like, with, doesn't he have a cleaver for a hand or something? Yeah. 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 Know, but... I was like, I knew you were going with that as soon as you said it. <laughs> well, moving on from the Sopranos, Surfwatch Labs put out a couple of, of alerts to our customers this week. Uh, we'll share them with you guys here. As always, you can just become a Surfwatch Labs customer. Plug for the company. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, we will accept your business. A critical VMware vCenter vulnerability was discovered. 
that could lead to unauthorized remote access. The vulnerability stems from an insecure configuration of remotely accessible JMX RMI service. In essence, without getting to all the technical jibber-jabber, uh, an attacker can take advantage of this flaw and use it to execute arbitrary code on the vCenter service. Uh, this could compromise the entire virtual network. The other SurfWatch Labs alert that was released to our customers this week had to do with the Drydax malware, and it has resurfaced and is targeting businesses. Hackers have used this malware to target UK bank accounts and tens of thousands of organizations having stolen 20 million euros in the UK and $10 million in the United States. Drydex was developed to harvest online banking information that can be used to target businesses as opposed to the everyday consumer. Drydex in its basic form is a high-end key logger that seeks out financial information but can also steal any sort of data a hacker might want. The malware affects Windows operating systems, and as with most malware, this piece infects computers via downloaded programs or phishing emails. Yeah, I, mean, I, I thought I saw that someone was arrested in relation to this malware this week, wasn't there? Yeah, there was, actually. Uh, part of th this whole Drydex malware, the reason we're talking about it right now is there was an international law enforcement operation that was headed by the FBI and Britain's National Crime Agency uh, that kind of disrupted this uh, Drydex campaign that we're talking about. And a key arrest was made. Authorities arrested Andre Ginkle. Ginkle was actually arrested on August 28th in Cyprus, which is in Europe. Currently, the United States is seeking his extradition so he can face charges in our country. Yeah, there was a few other pieces of legal news that happened this week as well. Uh, there's a lot of stuff coming out of California. Governor... Jerry Brown signed into law a few different things. He signed a new law that protects digital privacy rights. Uh, the new law is called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, and what it does is it bars any state law enforcement agency or other investigative entity from compelling a business to turn over any metadata or digital communications, including emails, text, and documents stored in the cloud without a warrant. And, and warrants will also be required to track electronic devices. Yeah, the governor also signed into law three bills revising the state's breach notification laws. The changes, which will, which are set to begin January 1st of 2016, describe standards for data encryption, provides common formatting and language for data breach notification, and changes standards for personal information to include data captured by automated license plate recognition systems. So a lot going on in California this week. We also had, uh, this, this was an interesting one. I didn't actually even know that this happened. There was a lawsuit from a employee at Coca-Cola against Coca-Cola after the company had some laptops stolen. Shane K. Enslin, who was an employee for Coca-Cola, had a court rule in his favor. Enslin sued Coca-Cola after the company had multiple laptops stolen by a former employee. It was like, it was 55 in total. Coca-Cola got all the uh, laptops back, but down the road, Enslin and others, they were the victims of identity theft. So Enslin went into a class action lawsuit against Coca-Cola, and some of the things that they claimed, I don't have all the information on that, were thrown out. But this in particular was ruled in his favor, and that was that he suffered harm because of these stolen laptops, which is going to open up the door down the road for uh, more lawsuits against Coca-Cola by these other people that could have been affected by that. Yeah, and that's actually what we were going to talk about coming up in that interview with Thomas Roback. We talk a lot about standing, and that's one of the, one of the, I guess, the tricky parts with cybersecurity is how do you decide if actual harm happened? You know, because you could have something stolen, and years down the road, you could, you know, have identity theft or something take place. We'll get to that in a minute. One other piece of legal news that happened, there was a cyber stalker uh, that uh, pled guilty, Stefan Rigo. He pleaded guilty to multiple counts of voyeurism and other offenses under the Computer Misuse Act. Now, this isn't all that uh, amazing, but what is interesting is that he made news because he was spying on people through their webcam for between 5 and 12 hours each day. So... He was pretty hardcore about this to spying. Uh, yeah, he was. It's pretty easy for people to break into these webcams. Uh, I think the big story that made a lot of news in the U.S. was Miss Teen USA. I think that was 2013. There was a case involving that, and 
someone she knew hacking into her webcam and extortion. You know, there's been a lot of cases like that in the news. Uh, but this guy, uh, this uh, Stefan Rigo, he received a 20 week suspended sentence and will be on the sexual offenders register for seven years. I can't believe it. So, and by the way, just so everyone is educated on this, a 20 week suspended sentence means that he will not be serving any jail time. So, I was a little bothered by that for some reason. Just just thinking about someone spying. I mean, I got my webcam on right now and just kind of thinking about someone possibly spying on me while I'm doing this is one thing. I'm sitting in front of my computer. I don't know. You're in your house, whatever you're doing. And some, that, that creeps me out. I don't like that. I, I wish he would have got a little more. There's all these communities where you can go. You can, you know, I think it's like for a little as, as a buck. They're, they're basically called slaves. So a person hacks someone's webcam and then there's one of their slaves and they can watch them and there's oh there's this whole creepy underground of people you know selling this stuff and taking screenshots and yeah it, it's pretty creepy but i remember when i wrote that article a few people read it and they were like yeah i'm definitely putting uh you know all you need is a little post-it note or a sticker you know something just to put over <laughs> your webcam it's really not a bad idea uh if that's something you're concerned about if someone wants to watch me i say let them i mean <laughs> <laughs> i don't live that exciting of a life so it, you can share in my boredom uh, right, right. Uh, moving on to other arrests. We had, this was also, this was kind of an interesting one too. This was kind of a revenge story that didn't work out for the guy. Um, a jury, uh, found a journalist guilty of helping Anonymous, the, the hacktivist group, uh, hack his, his former employer. Matthew Keyes was found guilty of aiding the hacktivist group Anonymous in hacking his former employer's computer systems. The event took place after Keyes had a dispute with a supervisor. Uh, in a retaliation effort, Keys Keys turned to members of Anonymous to seek revenge. Uh, Keys was found guilty of one count of conspiracy, one count of transmitting malicious code, and one count of attempting to transmit malicious code. Keys could serve. He faces a sentence of twenty five years in prison. Twenty five years for that. So the so the previous guy didn't serve any jail time for being a creeper. This guy looks up. Yeah. Well, the, the well, first of all, one's in the UK and one's in the US. So there's one oh, okay. there's there's one issue there. But a lot of the cybercrime reporting is I guess one of the issues I have with it is they always report the maximum, you know. So you'll have a guy who can get, you know, you get 2 years and there's 10 counts, so they say, "Oh, he can get 20 years in prison," which is yeah, he could, but they never do. Uh, I believe the the Reuters article said that it was likely to get recommended 5 years, I believe. If he if he spends a day in prison, it's longer than the creeper did on the guy that we just talked about. I guess is my point, but I, I digress. I'll, 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 we can move on. I'm done. I'm sorry. Uh, the final arrest, you know, it's, might as well keep going down this list of arrests. Here we have this a, a Ukrainian man who was extradited to the United States, Sergei Volvnenko. Uh, he was ex- extradited to the U.S. Uh, to face charges for allegedly taking part in a hacking operation. That stole login credentials and payment card data. Bovnenko was originally arrested in Italy last June. He also allegedly attempted to send heroin to cybersecurity expert Brian Krebs. I don't know if you guys read Brian Krebs' blog, but I remember that story. You know, someone sent him some drugs in the mail and then reported him to the cops. Allegedly, it was this guy who is now being extradited to the U.S. So <laughs> good on him. <laughs> that that's an interesting way to get to get to someone, I guess. And that uh, wraps up most of the big cybercrime events, advisories, and legal actions from the past week. Real quick, before we get on to the interview with Thomas Roback, uh, we have a funny story of the week from Matt. Were you able to find anything out there this week to make us chuckle? You actually shared a tweet with me having to do with an internet-enabled toilet seat. That's what I'm and asking it, for for Christmas. So I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm sending a list to Santa. Often when I think about the Internet of Things, thoughts about innovation, efficiency, and productivity come to mind. I think sometimes with something like that, I think our innovation kind of takes a weird turn, though. (laughs) After you shared that tweet with me, I started thinking about, well, what else is out there that's kind of like a weird IoT connected device? And I found an article that was written in February that was titled, it was from Light Reading, and it was titled, The 10 Weirdly Useful IoT Devices. So I'm just going to run down the quick list. There was 10 of them. The first one was a cat litter box. The second was a dog pedometer, so you could constantly be connected to see how many steps your dog has taken today. This was kind of a weird one. It was a uh, a onesie, which, uh, yes, is 
clothing for your baby that is internet enabled. The fourth was an Internet of Things mattress called Luna that monitors sleep, acts as an alarm, and can even start your coffee maker in the morning. Number five was a heartbeat transmitter. Number six was an egg tray that lets you know if you are low on eggs or if the eggs you have are too old. That's kind of an important one. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Number seven was called the Belty. This one was pretty neat. This is a fitness tracker that you wear around your waist. It actually looks like Batman's utility belt, which was kind of cool. It's really big and bulky, but all it does is record your movement. Well, that sounds way cooler than all these Fitbits and all these fitness watches everyone's wearing. I don't know. It's, you get to see it. I'll show you a picture. It's pretty bulky. Uh, <laughs> number eight uh, is a garden tool called Eden uh, that monitors your plants to inform you when they needed to be watered. It also uh, analyzes the sunlight and soil composition. See, now, I actually think that's kind of neat. Yeah. Oh, some of these are pretty good. Yeah. Some of them are pretty neat. I don't know uh, how much I need to use my smartphone to flush a toilet, but that seems pretty right. useful. <laughs> well, that even make the list. So, I mean, I, I don't, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, number nine is a cow monitor. This is a device that monitors a cow's health. And number 10, and this was the weirdest one in my opinion. This was an Internet of Things vibrator that allows partners to interact in person or from a long distance. So that was the list of 10 Weirdly useful IoT devices. All right, now coming up, we have our interview with Thomas Roback, who is a partner at Axum, Veltrop, and Harkrider. And we chat about the recent legal developments regarding data breach lawsuits. There's been a lot of legal news around data breaches recently, but first I just wanted to get your thoughts on lawsuits in general. I guess someone like me on the outside of the legal world, it seems like every time there's a data breach, like a week or two later, you hear about this potential class action lawsuit, but then many of those don't amount to anything. So just wondering your thoughts kind of on that. Sure. I I think what we're seeing is, and we're going to see more and more of it, Right now, this is the the tip of the iceberg. With most business litigation, if if some company harms harms you, either if you're another company or an individual consumer, uh, you sue them, and mm-hmm. you recover whatever damages you have. In the realm of cybersecurity, it, it gets a little bit more complicated because the the people generally who are harming you. Are, are not big corporations with plenty of assets that you can sue in court, but there are, uh, you know, instead three guys in a basement in Eastern Europe or, or uh, uh, somebody hacking around in Chicago or a government like China or Russia or North Korea deciding to, uh, to hack in and cause trouble. So if you're a consumer or if you're a corporation and you've been harmed, you don't have the normal ability to go after directly the person who's harmed you. Many times you can't even identify who it is. Mm-hmm. And even if you can, they may not have the, the, the assets or the wealth to, uh, to compensate you. What that leads to then are lawsuits where, because if you are harmed, you're looking for someone to, to cover your damages. And so you're having plaintiffs looking for someone else to pay. If it's the store that that was hacked and they have your credit card information, if it's the credit card company that issued you the credit card or the bank that's involved in, in negotiating those, those transactions, or, or maybe it's the cybersecurity firm that was supposed to make you hack proof, you're looking for someone to, to pay for this. The legal theories we've seen employed are all over the map. Contract, but to have a contract claim, you have to have privity of contract. You actually have to have a contract with someone. So in a lot of contexts, for example, the, the, the consumer doesn't have a direct contract with the, uh, the, the party that's in, involved in providing, uh, it might be the, uh, the transaction, the bank transaction for processing a credit card transaction. It might be the cybersecurity firm that was uh, supposedly uh, preventing a hack. So there, there may not be a contractual basis. You then can look at, at theories such as implied contract. If you are a big corporation and you have a uh, security firm that uh, is, is going to try and prevent 
you from getting hacked. A lot of those companies will uh, put in disclaimers and limitations of warranty so that when they perform the, the service, uh, your legal remedies against them are, are limited. Other theories uh, that we're seeing are, uh, and I think one that may have the, the most traction going forward is negligence. So basically, uh, whatever company it is, they should have done more. They they were careless in protecting your information. PII, as it's, it's called, personally identifiable information. There are other claims that are out there, breach of warranty, breach of fiduciary duty, invasion of privacy, unjust enrichment. There are also statutory causes of action. Most states now have some type of cause of action which enables a consumer to sue for, for a data breach uh, and, and that type of injury. So there, those are the types of actions that we will be seeing, uh, increasingly more and more of those. So far, the biggest issue that's come up in litigation, and it explains why a lot of this litigation hasn't gone too far, has been the fact that people haven't been able to meet the standing requirement. And standing, if you're in federal court, is a constitutional requirement that basically deals with the issue of you need a case in controversy. You have to have injury in fact that, that a court can address. So what happens is in the, in the cases that we've seen, you typically will have a situation where there's been a hack and consumers' data has been accessed. Well, they sue then and say, well, you know, someone's responsible, someone should pay, my data's been, been accessed. And the courts will look at this then and say, well, how have you been harmed? Your, your data's been accessed, but what does that mean in terms of harming you? Has anyone used it to your detriment? Mm -hmm. So there's a big difference between someone getting your information and someone using it to your detriment. There's uh, some in the uh, Seventh Circuit and, and the Ninth Circuit that talk about one of the leading uh, cases, and this is going back to 2007, is, is Piscata versus Old National Bank Corp. And another one is Krotner versus Starbucks, and this is in the Ninth Circuit. In those cases, the courts looked at it and said, you know what, if your information has been compromised, you do have standing because you've got greater, a greater risk of something happening. Krotner is a, a great example of this. Uh, Again, Starbucks. There was one where Starbucks had the, 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 their employees' information on a laptop. The laptop was stolen, and one of the employees sued and, mm -hmm. and said, well, you know, my information's been stolen. It's been compromised. I'm at risk now. And the court, the court said, you're right. You do have standing to pursue, to, to pursue a claim. In fact, Starbucks provided a year of, of free credit monitoring, uh, wouldn't have done that out of the kindness of its heart if there wasn't a real issue of standing and a risk of injury. Other cases, however, in circuits like the Third Circuit, have said, no, that, that's a future injury. Riley versus Ceridian Corporation in the Third Circuit is a good example of that. You're merely speculating that some, hack, that some hacker, someone who got your information, is going to use that to your detriment. Just because they got it doesn't mean that they're going to use it or use it to your, to your detriment. And so there the standing question comes up again. Over time, you saw a split in the circuits, some saying that you do have standing and some saying you don't. I should add that even some of these cases where they find that a plaintiff has standing to sue, the result is that they're ultimately dismissed because the courts then look to the state law and say, well, you may have standing to bring a, a case, but you haven't suffered injury under your, your state statute. So they get thrown out anyway. Uh, this split in the, in the circuits uh, continued, and you even have cases uh, in, the same, in the same district court, uh, the Southern District in New York. Some cases said you do have standing, some said you don't have standing, all on the same types of fact patterns. Uh, your data has been accessed somehow, but you haven't been harmed. There was a Supreme Court decision, which I think you've mentioned, uh, the Clapper decision uh, in 2013. 
a lot of people thought that this was going to resolve the split in the circuits, and it hasn't. Clapper was a case uh, that made its way up to the Supreme Court where you had attorneys and human rights organizations challenging a a federal uh, act, the, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which allowed surveillance of individuals who were not United States persons, who were reasonably uh, believed to be located outside the United States. And it, it provided for the ability of the government to intercept their calls and listen in. And these U.S. interests then filed a suit to challenge the constitutional, constitutionality of the act. And the court said, no, you don't have standing. The threatened injury that you see is too remote. It's speculative. And their analysis really looked at it and said, under this regime, what you're saying as a U.S. citizen, maybe you'll be in a phone call with one of these foreign entities at some point in the future. Maybe not. Maybe your conversation will be listened to. Maybe not. Maybe the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court will grant permission to allow an interception of that conversation. Maybe not. No one has accessed your data. No one has intercepted your call. You're just speculating of something in the future. You don't have standing. And so a lot of courts then thought, well, this is this has resolved the standing question. But it actually hasn't. And not surprisingly, the split continues sort of the same way as it did before Clapper. So you have courts in the Ninth Circuit and the Seventh Circuit concluding that Clapper, and I think, I think there's some, some good reasoning to those cases, looking at it saying, well, that really dealt with a situation that was very, very attenuated. Here we have people whose we know their data has been accessed. They have been harmed. It's like being exposed to a toxic uh, chemical or an asbestos or something where you, you've suffered this exposure and it's just a matter of time until you're injured. Other courts, though, in the Third Circuit, again, they look at it and say, no, Clapper has sort of resolved this, this dispute. And they go back to Riley against Ceridian and say it, it, hasn't, uh, it hasn't changed it. You can't have standing if your claim is too speculative. There's one case called Horizon Healthcare Services, and it's it's in the uh, District of New Jersey, and that's one where they said, you know, this type of of access to to information is not going to give you, it's a threatened injury, not enough to provide standing. That's before the Third Circuit now, and if the Third Circuit rules the same way as it has in the past, we'll have a, a split again between between that and the uh, the Neiman Marcus case, uh, which was decided in 2015. That's in the Seventh Circuit. So if, if Horizon Healthcare goes up to the Third Circuit, which it has gone up, and the Third Circuit rules that there's no standing, that will contrast to the Neiman Marcus case, uh, Remedius uh, versus uh, Neiman Marcus, where standing was found. And I, I don't know if that's it's too technical or or it's helpful. Yeah, that was very helpful because you know, as someone like myself who hasn't really followed this, the big headlines in July when the Neiman, when the Neiman Marcus ruling came out, everyone was saying, you know, this is going to make it easier for uh, companies to get sued, and and basically kind of going along those lines. Uh, do you think that that was kind of a, an overreaction then uh, from a lot of these blogs that I was reading? It it, it certainly helps. Plaintiffs gain standing. The question, though, is going to come down to uh, what's their actual damage. And if you re- if you recognize the fact that that this is really the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals stating the same position that that circuit had before the Clapper decision, the interesting decision is going to be coming out of the Third Circuit. And, and then when you have a split in the circuits again on this same issue, that'll probably go up to the Supreme Court and have to be resolved that will have some effect. So what this may mean is if if you're in California or, or in Chicago, you may have standing. If you're in Philadelphia, you might not. But the Supreme Court will presumably resolve that, that split. If you go to that, though, and you look at what's happening in these cases, even if they have standing, 
the recoveries are, are very limited or, they, or the courts throw them out saying there is no basis for a recovery. You may have standing to bring a suit, but you haven't suffered any damages. Yeah, and, and I was wondering, I guess, kind of going back to the, you were talking earlier about negligence, even if they do mm-hmm. have standing, I would imagine that the company would still have to have some sort of negligence or have done something. I mean, if they've done their part and, and done these best practices. Well, you know, that, that's a, sort of an interesting point, because we've seen over the last few years all sorts of, of new regulations coming from everyone, from the FTC, from the Securities and Exchange Commission, from just about every agency in, uh, you can think of. And they are establishing some clear guidelines as to things that companies should do to, to keep data safe. Mm-hmm. Now, that's very comforting for corporations to know here are the things we need to do. There's a, there's a funny, but there, there, there's kind of a double-edged sword. While on the one hand, it gives them a clear roadmap of the things they need to do so that they are acting prudently and properly, it also gives the plaintiffs and the plaintiff's bar an opportunity to say, well, we now know what the standard of care is, and if you didn't meet it, you're negligent. Prior to that, it was a little loosey-goosey, you know, what should you have done? We don't have standards yet. It's all too new. But now it's getting more clarified, and I think in, in some ways that will help the plaintiff's bar say, well, here's the clear standard. You didn't meet it. Just like, you know, you have securities laws, and if, if people don't meet, meet the requirements there, then, then there's liability. Yeah, I mean, you could make the case then that a lot of, you know, the company is, is the victim. You know, they get hacked or the victim of this attack, and then they're also getting sued on top of it. I mean, I can see I've heard people make that, that case. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what we're probably going to see is increasingly, I, I think we're going to see a, a greater tendency to find standing, to find injury, and I think the injury will happen. One of the anomalies that, that, that if, if you look at it is data being accessed. It can go in a few different ways. One, some, some tapes with data fall off a truck or are stolen. You have no idea, or the laptop computer is stolen. You have no idea if the thief is actually interested in using any of the data there or just wanted the laptop computer. So that's one hurdle. The next one is they've accessed your data, but if, if they don't do anything with it, you haven't been harmed. But all that changes if you think about it in terms of time. Well, they access it in the year 2013, and nothing happens. Then in 2015, suddenly people are having all their, their confidential questions answered and they're signing up for this or signing up for that. So it's, it could be years later when the data is used. And then you need to trace it back to the hack. I just wanted to get your opinion then on, you know, say your business and you're listening to this and you're worried about liability. Um, but like you said, there's not really necessarily clear standards. I mean, do you have any advice for what they should focus on? Well, I, I certainly think that, that companies should be looking at all the standards that are coming out, whether, whether it's from the FTC or the Securities and Exchange Commission. There are so many standards coming out for them to look at as far as best practices and, and mandatory procedures, things that they must do. So those are things that, that companies should be doing. Right now, the, the conventional wisdom is, you are going to be hacked, not, uh, not a question of, of if, but only when. Set up right now those procedures so that you can identify when you've been hacked, you can identify and close the hack and confine the damage. You notify the people who have been affected promptly. You, you have the board of directors involved in cybersecurity. You have a cybersecurity officer. Those are things that companies will need to do. That's going to be part of, of normal corporate America going forward is what are you doing to protect data? What are you doing to protect your customers? And, and I think that's where an awful lot of the, uh, of the excitement in the terms of litigation is going to be in the future. So the companies that are, are best at protecting their data, protecting their customers, notifying their customers, finding and 
closing uh, leaks, those are the ones that are going to do better than the ones that missed it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty much all the questions I have, unless there's any other trends or things you wanted to touch on quick. We've covered the uh, the, the big issues. I guess the, the, the most important thing they can do is make sure they have a, a smart lawyer helping them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Not at all. Nice chatting with you. And that'll do it for this week's episode. Thanks to Thomas Robeck for stopping by to explain some of that legal stuff for us. The Cybercrime and Business Podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs delivers cyber risk intelligence solutions that help organizations understand the potential for cyber attacks, determine the impact of their business, and practically address threats head on. If you enjoy this podcast, you can subscribe or find more episodes on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, and all the major podcasting sites. And for more information on how to stay safe from cybercrime, check out surfwatchlabs.com.